Now, I realize that there's a grander narrative here, but I'm wondering if you've ever tried to figure out why Satan is angry all the time. Have you ever tried to reconcile, reflect on why it is Satan is angry all of the time. There is never a time when Satan is not vicious, vile, angered, enraged. And I've thought about it. I've thought about it. And one of the reasons why Satan is always angry is because every time he does his best work, his masterpiece, God has a way of taking whatever he's done and turning it around and making it serve his righteous purpose. In fact, the reason why the devil is perpetually annoyed, angry, and enraged is because no matter how well he does a thing, the God that you and I serve is able to take it. And when God gets done with what he meant for evil, God can extract from whatever heinous, vicious, diabolical scheme he's put together, and God can extract good out of it no matter how well Satan has done it. And Satan is perpetually angry because God always wins. I was listening to a man who was trying to play chess on a machine. And I could hear him, well, I can't give you his language. <laughs> but what was clear was that every time he made a move, the machine somehow could predict what he was going to do next and tort for it. And what he kept saying was, I don't care what I do, I can't win. And I thought to myself, that's exactly how the devil feels. Because many of the things that he did to you and in your life and put you through was because he thought he could win. What he didn't understand is that God takes the worst of our situations and, and the hardest thing we've been through and somehow God has a way of taking the most heinous of hurts, the most diabolical evil done, and turning that thing around so that when you look back on it years later, you see how you've grown, you see how much wiser you are, you have insight, you have survived, and no matter how hard he tried to destroy you, God always wins. Do I have a witness anywhere? You, when, when you look at this story, when you look at this narrative, you have to appreciate, you have to embrace the fact that for whatever reasons, and these are sovereign reasons, you and I have a God who has allowed for the accommodation of evil in our world. I know it doesn't feel good all the time. There are times when you wonder, Lord, how in the world can you see this and do nothing? But the way the sovereign God has set up the cosmos, the universe, the world, the way it works is that God has allowed evil in our sphere. Now, the presence of evil is temporary. That's why we celebrate. Because grandmama told us the right way, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. We realize that while evil is an accommodation in the world we live in today, there is a God who one day said, I'm going to recreate the whole thing. But for now, you and I live in a world that at least for now accommodates evil. And you see, sometimes you've got to reconcile the ways in which that will operate in your life without becoming bitter. Joseph is a young man, and if you look at the life of Joseph in this text, you get a sense that as a young man, he has believed that God has destined him for greatness. That somewhere along the line, God has made a commitment to him vis-a-vis -vis the dream experience, 
that what I'm going to do, Joseph, is I am going to elevate you. And he actually does. When you read this text, you can see something of this young man that is admirable. But I want you to see something of a God who is even greater without trying to identify just the character, I think, attributes of Joseph or any of the other characters in biblical history. I want you to be able to see a God that works in a system, in a world where evil exists, but does it in a way that always brings you out. In fact, if you look inside this passage, verse 2 says that this is the account of Jacob and his family when Joseph was 17 years old. He often tended his father's flock. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. The text says that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. And, and could I just offer this idea about Joseph? If, if I'm thinking of, of a caveat about why I think he's a pretty good guy, I just want to recognize the fact that at 17, he's got a job. The, the, the text says that, that he, he's, he works. At, at 17, this boy actually has a job. Now, I know I recognize that culturally speaking, this was a part of, of where they were in terms of the culture. But, but I'm just saying that this is an industrious fella. He's a hardworking fella, and I like him because of that. When you read this text, though, you should not read into it the theology of Andrew Lloyd Webber, Joseph, and the Technicolor coat. Because I want you to go beyond that. People often say to me, well, you know what? I went to see this movie and I don't like it. And I say to them, why? They say, well, I saw Exodus, Gods, and Kings, and that's not the way it is in the Bible. Or they say, I went to see the movie Noah, and if you look at the movie Noah, that's not exactly the way it is in the Bible. Period, full stop. I don't go to the movies for Bible study. I, I, I'm not looking for people who make movies to be theologians. When I go to the movie, all I want is a good movie. I'm not exegeting the movie to see if the movie is consistent with the biblical record. Because if I read the Bible, I don't need a movie producer to give me Bible study. You need a Bible teacher or a pastor for that. I get weary of people who go to movies and come back mad at the movie. What for? It's a movie. You go to Bible study to study the Bible, and you go to the movies to be entertained. The problem is some folks go to church to be entertained. And never study the Bible. Do not be mad at Andrew Lloyd Webber. Because the truth is that he gets some things right, but a lot of things wrong. You say, Williams, what is that? First of all, the coat that Joseph receives from his father is not solely just limited in favoritism. You see, the text has Joseph working with his brothers. But in the ancient world, a coat of many colors that was long and sleeved was not only indicative of favor, it was indicative of status. Which means when his father gives him the coat, it is not just indicative of him favoring the son, it is changing the status of the son from a laborer to a manager. And now the boys can't stand him, not just because he's daddy's favorite. This is not about favoritism, this is about classism. Because you used to be a part of the labor rank and file, but now you have been elevated to over us. And we didn't like you to begin with. <laughs> but now that you are a manager over us, we really can't stand you. And you see, sometimes you gotta appreciate that you are not the only person who has problems on the job. They don't like Joseph because of who Joseph is. Joseph has not done anything to them. You feel some days that somehow you're the only person who has bad supervisors, managers, and coworkers. I'm here to tell you, you're not the first person to have a bad day at the office, and you will not be the last. 
And if you were to call up Joseph, Joseph would say, no, I hadn't done nothing to nobody. He said, all I did was I was elevated, I was favored, yes, and for whatever reasons, my brother hated me because of it. And you know what, when you think about this text, you should not lose sight of that because every now and then, God has to put you in a situation where everybody just can't like you. And you're going to have to start working through now how you're going to handle that. In fact, I might be preaching to myself. But what God is going to do is put you in some environment where everybody does not become your fan. And what you cannot do is walk around with an attitude. You can't fight fire with fire. You can't be mad and hate because people hate you. You're going to have to learn how to suck it up and do what it is God has called you to do and keep right on rolling. How dare you let everybody on the job affect your day? You come home mad because you had a bad day in the office. Well, what happened to the Holy Ghost? And the strength he provides and the joy of the Lord that is your strength. Stop letting everybody else dictate your attitude and your mood and find a way to rejoice in the Lord always. Joseph is given this sort of privileged position and, and what I want you to be able to identify is that Joseph was a fella who, while truthful, he didn't have a lot of tact. This is why sometimes when God shows you things about you, it's helpful if sometimes you keep them to yourself. Now, now, one of the things I like about Joseph, in spite of the fact that it appears he doesn't have a lot of tact, is that Joseph is able to identify what is good and what is bad. I know that I won't get through this today, but will you just bear with me for a minute? Because I got a lot that I want to heap off here. I am not mad at Joseph because Joseph in this text, the Bible says not only was he loved, but the Bible says here inside verses 2 and the, the B section of verse 2, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. And I want to speak to you young people about this idea in relationship to snitching. Because you see, I've got some strong views about snitching. You see, I think if you and I do a crime together and I get caught, I can keep my mouth shut because I don't have to expose you because of what I did. So I can keep my mouth shut because we did it together. I got caught and I'm going to do my time because that's what I deserve. But if I see a crime, and I know who did it. I'm going to tell it. Because that ain't snitching. That's being a good witness and being a good citizen. And you say, well, Reverend, I don't see it like that. Well, wait until they hurt your family member. And you got to run all over trying to get somebody to tell the truth about what they saw and then come back and holler at me and tell me how that feels. Joseph had an entrenched sense of right and wrong because of the way he had grown up. This was a young man who had seen his father Jacob and Laban spend their lives lying to each other. This was a man who saw Rachel, his mama, lie about the idols she had stolen. And he had grown up in a family in which lying was more prevalent than telling the truth. This was a young man who at about 11 saw his sister Dinah raped and his brothers murder an entire town. And Jacob is now at a place where Joseph is now at a place when he sees what's wrong, he gonna say it. And the problem we have in our culture today, particularly in the community called African American, is that we won't say what is right, won't tell what is true, and we suffer as a result of it. You're not snitching because you advocate for what's right. And sometimes you gotta suffer for being truthful and telling what's right. But I tell you what, there's a better reward for telling the truth on what is right and righteousness than tucking it away because the problem in our world is not the people speak, it's that they are silent. Somebody said, well, you know, Joseph is a snitch. No, he's not. 
He's seen enough in his life to tell him that it's always better to just say what is true. And his brothers don't understand that. There is this idea that when you can identify what is good and what is bad, you have to recognize that there will be some people who will not like you because of it. He has had to endure the overwhelming cultural shame of being a part of a clan that has murdered the people of Shechem. He's made a decision, I ain't going out like that no more. Because I realized at the beginning of the end of evil is when people learn how to tell the truth. <laughs> Even if it injures themselves, they're willing to stand up and to say what is right. And Joseph has made this kind of commitment. Now, you need to understand that when you make that kind of commitment, there are going to be people who envy you. And it doesn't matter what you have. I think when you look at this text, one of the things I want to try to work through in my own head and in my heart is a cultural shift that I see. Because envy is different than covetousness. You see, when you have to deal with people who are envious, a person who envies, they don't want what you have, they just don't want you to have it. Come on, stay with me. When, when a person is envious, they don't want what you have. They just don't like the fact that you have it. When a person is covetous, they don't like the fact that you have it to the degree that they'll steal it if they can. That's different from being envious. When a person covets, they want what you've got to the degree that they'll take it from you. They'll steal it. But people who envy don't want what you got. They just want to destroy what you got so that you can't have it. And whenever you make a decision to live in this way, you have to recognize that there are going to be people. Let me tell you what envy does. Envy is that thing that resents the blessing and the blessed one. It's, it's not just the blessing. They resent the blessing and they resent the person who holds the blessing. And that's what makes envy so diabolical. You say, what's wrong with his brothers? They envy him. And they don't just envy him, they envy what he has and they want to destroy him and steal and take away all that God wants to provide with Joseph and use Joseph's life. And sometimes you got to recognize that you live in a world where evil still exists. What bothers me sometimes is that in recognizing I live in a world where evil exists, we miss the fact of the envy that is sometimes a part of it. And the cultural problem I have for Dan Williams, this is what bothers me. I recognize that envy is a part of the world. And the devil has messed you and I up to such a degree that while we don't embrace envy, we want to be envied. While we do not embrace being envious, what we do want is to be envied. You know why you post what you post? You, you know why you, you put on social networks what you put on? Because you're trying to say, see me. And while I'm not envious, the cultural shift is toward people who want to be envied. That's why they put their stuff on social network to say to others, see what I got, see who I am. And that's just as dangerous because what you do is open yourself up to stuff you don't have to open yourself up. You see, don't, don't wonder why they knock on your door when you put certain stuff on Instagram, Facebook. And there's always a danger that's associated with this kind of social mentality that is pathological and misses the fact that the goal of life is not to be the envy of others. 
And the goal of life is not to be envious of others. The goal of life is to take what God has given you and use what God has given you. And even in the midst of difficulty, keep looking up saying, God, I realize you can turn it around. Parliament Funkadelic said to each is reaching. If I don't cop, it ain't mine to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Pastor George Clinton. But when God gives you something, when God does something, you need to realize that sometimes it comes with a kind of enduring quality and you got to go through some things. Because Joseph hasn't done anything. His identification of God's dream has been something he's wanted to sort of just lay out, but he doesn't have any tact. Sometimes you got to be careful in not telling everybody all that God has said to you. Some things you got to just tuck in your heart because everybody can't handle what it is God wants to do. Have you ever known people for whom you can't tell them of the Lord's blessing? Because the minute you do, they become envious and the whole relationship gets jacked up. You hide stuff, you don't say stuff, you don't, because you know once they find out, they are gonna get jealous. There's some people in my family who I'll call and I have to call others because if I call them and I don't call them, they are gonna talk and say, how come he didn't call me? But this commitment to the truth, this commitment to what's good, what's right, will save your life. You say, why? Well, recognize that it's a better way to live, but also recognize that the beginning of the end of evil inevitably carries with it rejection and pressure. You know what I understand as I look at this text? Joseph is 17 years old, and I see this in our own social context, and I'm trying to close. That young people need acceptance much more than most adults. I'm not saying that everybody doesn't need acceptance. But I'm saying that a lot of what's going on in our communities and in our world, particularly among the other generation, where they're smoking, trapping, drinking, or whatever it is, they're involved in that because to some degree, the need to be accepted, the need to be involved. I know a lot of young people who don't do behaviors because they enjoy it. They do it and they got drawn into it because they were looking for somebody to accept them. One of the reasons why gangs exist is because it's a family structure. And sometimes the absence of structure and acceptance in a family has produced another kind of pressure. And let me offer this word to you too. Wise parents should recognize something about unnecessary pressure. If you're young, you have to endure peer pressure. But one of the things about the text that caught my attention was the fact that Jacob, in light of his love for his son, has actually placed on him an unnecessary pressure by giving him the coat and the elevation. Because, you see, when you spoil your child, you make it hard for them to mature and grow up. And unwittingly, you are placing on them a kind of pressure that they cannot handle. In fact, you live in a world today where if you send your child out with certain stuff, he's got to explain, fight, and fend jealous other people the entire day of his life. And parents can sometimes place unintended pressure on children without thinking and to have to live in that along with the more common peer pressure that children and youngins put on each other can be a tremendous weight and unfortunately I would argue that to some degree that's what's taking place in this text this dream that he shares this idea of recognizing what God would do Strangely enough, the second dream that Joseph has includes his mother, who is dead. The text says, what kind of dream is that, he asks. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? Verse 11, but while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Joseph has had a dream that includes the emergence even of Rachel, who was dead. And this is a young man who is not somehow foreign to pain. 
He's buried his mother. He's seen his nanny slash nurse, Deborah. He's experienced the hatred of his brothers. And yet, God is doing something with this man in spite of all that's taking place in his life. God is directing him and sovereignly moving him. Joseph doesn't have it all together, but he's gotten a glimpse. And he's recognized that God is going to do something with my life. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know how. But I'm already convinced that God is going to do something with my life. And I submit to you this morning that if you understand the beginning of the end of evil, you recognize that you have to identify what's good, what's bad. And you have to recognize that inevitably there's going to be some rejection and there's going to be some pressure. But I'd also say to you, you have to recognize the divine intricacies of God's plan that can bring good out of evil no matter what you have to go through. In fact, you should be thinking now and asking God, not only what are you making me, but anticipating what it is God is going to do in the aftermath. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know that you can't lose because God always wins. It doesn't mean you won't suffer loss. Because when you walk with the Christ, when you are led of the Lord, there's something about the life that you are called to live, that every now and then there will be deficits that God can turn into pluses. But you got to accept the math that they are deficits at least for now. And realize that even what people might have meant for evil, God can turn it around and use it for good. You know what I like about this text, and it won't be easily discerned in 37. But while he has actually shown a direction, I think there's theological import for the appearance of this person. And I conclude with this. Verse 15 simply says, verse 14, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. Keep in mind that what Joseph was supposed to do was to go see about the welfare of his brothers. And I would tell you now, <laughs> you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> that later on, the welfare of his brothers is exactly what he'll see about. That was the initial mission that didn't come to flourishing quickly, but it will come to flourishing eventually. Joseph is sent on a mission regarding the welfare of his brothers. And the text says in 15, when he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside and says, what are you looking for? He asked, I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him, they have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. Now I would simply say to you that Joseph, without being too hard on the young man, maybe the reason he's wandering is because he doesn't have the kind of pasture experience his brothers do. What I would also say to you is that every time the Hebrew writer has identified a man, there has always been some theological and divine significance. You remember in 32, he wrestled with a man to the break of day. And it turns out that that man, while unnamed, was nobody but God. You see, here again, he lost and he's wandering. And the text says that he ran into a man. And that man just happened to overhear some things and give him direction so he could get to where, Lord, I wish. Don't you know that sometimes God sovereignly and providentially will place people, things, circumstances in your life in order to direct you where you need to go to keep you from wandering around lost 
the rest of your life. Is there anybody here who can say, I know that's true? Because if it wasn't for who God put in my own life, I'd still be wandering around in circles looking for where I'm supposed to be. But God sent somebody. And because of that man, Joseph is directed in a way that ultimately fulfills the purpose and God's righteous purpose for his life. You say to me, Williams, what has that got to do with me? Well, God has placed someone that he has favored and loved. In fact, I heard him say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear him. Favored by his father, sent for the welfare of others to redeem us, but has to go through the hostility as creature of his creation to get to a place called the cross in order to redeem us to buy us back out of the slave market. And so he who knew no sin became sin for us in order to redeem us. And you know, that's the story of Jesus and the story of a father who sent his son as the beginning of the end of all kinds of evil. And for right now, you go through what you need to go through. Endure what you need to endure. Aware that you serve a God who even when it looks like you're losing, in the end, you will win. In the end, he will be glorified. In the end, you will be strengthened to the glory, to the honor of his name.